Okay, good day and welcome to Gaming with Colonel. I'm Sean Moran, and today we're going to talk about Columbia Games East Front, The War in Russia, 1941 to 45. And I, I actually have a older edition, I think it's a first edition, um, <clears throat> with that old uh, tiger on the box there. Uh, and it's designed by Tom Daglish and Craig Bazinkin. And my edition is 1991. <clears throat> So, we'll, uh, we'll have a little look at the map and talk about uh, sequence and turn play, and we'll, we'll also talk about uh, what I think about the game. Um, first off, I did play um, the Barbarossa scenario, so the opening scenario for uh, 1941. Um, you have, I think, about five or six different scenarios, so you can play the entire campaign game. Um, it obviously, it would take a while. <laughs> I think it's six to eight hours if you're gonna play the whole campaign. But I've just I've had this set up for a couple of weeks and playing turns as I can. So, anyways, let's have a let's have a quick look at the map here. So, on the obviously on the left hand side there uh, down here you've got Romania. There's there's Bucharest. Uh, you've got uh, Poland, uh, Warsaw, uh, Danzig, the Baltic Sea, East Prussia, um, and there's actually start lines. There's sort of on the map here for different scenarios for you know, 41, 42, and I believe there's even a 44 at some point. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, you've got the mass, mass, massiveness of uh, Russia. Minsk, Kiev, uh, Moscow is over here. Uh, what's other prominent things? I was able to take um, Sevastopol down here, and of course, uh, Leningrad up at the top there. So, what can we say about uh, Barbarossa? <clears throat> um, let's start off by uh, talking a little bit about the terrain on the map. I mean, there's a lot of obviously clear terrain, but you've also got some woods, uh, and some swamp, and even some mountain areas in the in the south here. Um, one of the things about terrain is that the only one that really affects you is swamps. You 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 basically move into it and, and have to stop, except for Calvary, I believe. Um, and if you're in a mud weather, then every every movement gets reduced by one. <clears throat> um, I won't talk about the Columbia Games combat system because it's the same as always. Uh, the blocks don't have the Fs on them, but uh, the 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 combat system basically you get um, uh, they call it single, double, or triple file fire. Um, for example, the infantry would fire at single, meaning they have to roll a a six. Or, or it's a one. <laughs> I can't remember the top of my head. It's one of those. It's let's let's call it sixes. Um, and a, an armored units would would fire at a double fire. So that means they would roll a five or six to get a hit. <clears throat> and the only time you actually have triple fire is like uh, when you're using air combat, which is something we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, other blocks, there's cavalry blocks, they, they have single fire and mechanized blocks, which uh, have double fire in defense, but uh, otherwise they're single fire for, for the offense. <clears throat> okay, so the way the game turn goes is you start with basically what's called a production phase. And fortunately, it's upside down here, but it says production. And in this particular scenario, I think the Germans started with something like, uh, I want to say, 54 uh, production points and the Soviets at 64 but then you gain points as you capture uh, cities so you'll notice here's a better one it's Stalingrad it's actually got a a one so you get another point for that so your base point for the Germans let's say where it's 54 but if they capture these cities they get more those points added to them and <clears throat> interesting to note they there's also oil wells really hard to see that it's a little oil well symbol and they the uh, Germans get double the value when they capture them. This would be one to be worth two. So actually over here in uh, Ploesta, this has a four, and the actual Germans get eight for it uh, because they ramped up the production is what it is. So what you do at the beginning is you figure out your production points, not in the first turn, obviously, and then uh, you will uh, go ahead and, and use those points to either increase the strength of a unit, so... Uh, if this one was at two, you'd increase them to one, and I believe that costs 
don't have it in front of me, but I believe it costs the Russians three of those production points. The production points for the Germans are way more expensive. Uh, it's basically double. So in fact, that would have probably cost six um, if that was a German mechanized unit. So you use them to add um, uh, steps to your um, blocks or use them to make what's called a cadre, meaning you make a, a block that may have been killed. Um, you can bring them back as a replacement. They can only come in as a one and uh, it costs double uh, for that, to bring that block in. Um, and they can come in on major cities, you know, such as uh, Rostov is considered a major city. Two units can come on a major city and uh, minor cities that are uh, cities without uh, an actual number, like in this case, Krasnodar, you could bring in one unit for replacement. <clears throat> and then right after that, you'd actually roll for weather. And in the summer months, it's always dry. But once you get into um, you know, fall and spring, you have a chance of getting mud, and definitely you get into winter and you get snow once you get to uh, December, January, and February. And what dry, obviously, is the best for movement. Uh, mud, you, it's reduced by one. And um, snow, um, you, you also have some other reductions with, with snow, specifically with uh, German headquarters uh, being disrupted, meaning that they have less range to do uh, to their command function. So, what do you actually do in a turn? Let's see if I can get a better shot here. So, this is a Romanian headquarters, so this might be a good one to do. So, you basically figure out what headquarters you're going to activate and you flip them up. Okay, so in this case, I had a. I, I, I played about a, a year and a half. I played a whole uh, year of 41 and started to get into 42, and I just decided I thought I'd stop and do the video, and then I'll, I'll probably pack this up because it's been fun, but it's time for me to move on to something else. So what you do is you, you, you activate your, your headquarters. And the way I do it is I go around the board, find all the headquarters, and sometimes they can get lost in these blocks. And then you decide, what am I going to do with them? They can immediately move one hex by themselves if they want, like towards other units so they can command them. And this headquarters has a two on it. This is Romanian headquarters. So it means it has a range of two. So uh, any, hex, any uh, blocks... Uh, uh, access blocks within two hexes can be commanded by the unit and they can then move and infantry have a movement of two and armored units have a movement of three. Uh, we can't move into swamps, that's not a very good example. Anyway, so you'd move your blocks around, let's say we move these guys over here, and you would do that wherever you're going to move. Then you get into the battle phase and any, any uh, Axis units that are in a Russian hex, that's considered a battle hex. <clears throat> and if they're still within range of the headquarters, they are considered to be supported, meaning that they can fire at normal firepower. If this was further away, even though they moved in there, they are unsupported, so meaning that any time um, they fight, they have, they have to roll double in order to get a hit. Um, <clears throat> headquarters can also provide air power, so... Uh, at the beginning in 1941, they can do triple fire. So because this is a strength of two, you'd roll two dice. And if you roll a four, five, or six, you get hits on whatever battle hex within range that, uh, that you uh, are, uh, are supporting. You can only use air for one battle hex, but a headquarters can support uh, any number of battles that were, are within range. <clears throat> Uh, something else to note is that there are hexide limits, um, and for the most part, they are, I believe, two. I should know this top of my head, but I believe it's two blocks can move through a hexide, and in a woods, it's actually only one that can move through a hexide. So you have to pay attention to how you're maneuvering blocks into uh, into hexes. But there is only one round of combat. So how combat would go is you'd, we'd move these guys in, we would do the air, then immediately the uh, Russians would be able to do a defensive fire. And then these three blocks would then uh, do their fire. That would end the combat round. And then you would do whatever other combat you had. And you don't have to do combat. You can choose not to. Um, and again, even if there is no, if there's blocks in the same hexes, but there's no headquarters around, you could still do unsupported combat. Um, first turn, um, or not, attacking across the river uh, is fine, but any time after that. There is a potential for repulsing fire across a river. So if 
these Germans were, let's say, attacking across this river here, uh, when the Russians rolled their dice, um, uh, let's say, that, you know, it said they've got a, a combat factor of one, so they roll the dice. If they got any sixes, they would take it, they would get a hit. And more importantly, if they roll a one, uh, it means one of these units is repulsed back across the river. So that's uh, that's something to note. Kind of a neat rule. There are strategic headquarters. The Germans have one, and the uh, Russians have one. Um, and with the strategic headquarters, the supreme headquarters, they uh, they cannot support combat. But what they can do is is do strategic moves. So what that means is that a uh, anywhere on the board, they don't have to be with range. The strategic headquarters can move. If they have a strength of three, it's doubled. So this guy, if he's at three, he can move six blocks anywhere on the board, either by land or by rail. That's something I forgot to mention, is that these red lines are, are railways. Uh, or they can do sea move from uh, port to port um, using strategic movement. <clears throat> Supreme Headquarters can also be used to do airstrikes and... Uh, I believe they have double the range, but otherwise it works the same way as as uh, the airstrikes for uh, for headquarters. Um, there's also something called blitz movement. So a headquarters. That's like a better example here. Let's move over here. <clears throat> let's crank this guy up and move him over. Okay, so let's say we got a headquarters here, and he is. Um, got a strength of three. I activate him. Um, this blitz thing is really trying to, uh, I guess, bring in the factor of, um, what would you call it? Uh, exploitation. So what would happen is you activate, you do your movement and you do your attack. Let's say I move this uh, headquarters unit there anyways. We do the attack and let's say I'm successful and I, I, I kill everybody in the hex. And it cost me one. I have to turn my headquarters. I forgot to mention that. Once you once you do your first combat thing, you and you've done all your your attacks within range, you lose a step. But then, if I've identified him to do a blitz movement um, or a blitz command is what it is. It's really what it's called. Then anybody who's now within two hexes, because his headquarters is down at two, can move again. Anybody can move again, and you can also do a whole. Uh, separate combat. Uh, anybody who's in uh, in hexes, and they can be supported. So in which case these guys could move again, and that allows you get get to do breakthroughs and and do encirclements and whatnot. So it's kind of a neat rule. The only thing is that it costs another point, so you really lose your strength factors on the headquarters quite quickly. So you kind of plan that stuff out in the very beginning and. Kind of in the winter, you're trying to build those guys back up, still while trying to maintain some sort of attacks. <clears throat> so that is blitz movement. <clears throat> okay, um, I'll talk a little bit about what's kind of what happened in my game. Uh, it started off pretty well, and you can see over here in the, the north, um, I made it pretty far. I actually, let me tilt this properly. Where's Moscow? Moscow's over here. So I got pretty close, you know. Um, I'm kind of mucking around here in the south, uh, you know, getting kind of blocked by uh, some of these rivers, but I did okay up here. And really what's happening is the Russians are just kind of falling back, and I think I might have done one counterattack that I thought I had favorable odds. And in some cases, if I had enough blocks, I'd, I'd do some, some unsupported attacks just to see what would happen. But Otherwise, as typical with any sort of Russian front campaign game, you're uh, you are you are you know as the Russians just trying to wear the Germans down. Anyways, I um so as you can see, I I made it to about here, uh, and it is I just finished February forty two. Uh, oh, and that's another thing. In, in snow terms, the Russians go first. In dry terms, um, and I think mud terms, the uh, the Germans get to go first. <clears throat> so, overall impressions, um, uh, I, I like this game, I think it's uh, pretty decent. It's, it's interesting because you kind of get 
lost in terms of, how do I say this? It's not like a hex encounter game where you're sort of pouring over top of the, the map and going, oh yeah, I can see, you know, what my front line is. And you can see how high I've got the, the blocks sort of facing me so I can see them all. But you can't, you can't see that. You actually kind of have to go through and look at the blocks each time and figure out, yeah, where was that headquarters? You know, so it's, it makes it, um, tricky is not the right word. I guess interesting or, or different, really, as opposed to looking over, let's say, Stalingrad 42 in that video I made recently, um, where you can sort of see everything and you, you can see where the units are. So that's kind of unique. It's that whole fog of war thing, right? And it's a little, I guess it's a little tougher when you're playing by yourself kind of thing. But anyways, <clears throat> I've played this game probably four times now. I I like it. I think I'd probably be interested in getting the earlier or the latest edition. Now I've got the old rules. I, in fact, printed off. You can't see it because it's I ran out of ink on the last page, but I printed stuff that printed off the latest rules, to um, which are way better uh, laid out. It's easier to go through than the older ones, in my, in my opinion, anyways. Um, and I guess I would say, hmm, if I compare this to, let's say, a Bobby Lee or a Sam Grant, which you obviously can't because it's a different, you know, war and over. But it's those games are a little easier to manage. Why? There's less blocks. Like, look at all the blocks that I got on the board here. <laughs> you know, it's it's massive, which is fun. I, you know, I like that. Um, but you do need some time to play it. And it, this this is the kind of game you really want to have two people playing it because you're, you know, you're. What I'm getting is the whole sort of not. It's not a simulation, but I'm just getting the feel for the Russian front and how massive it was by playing a game like this. So I definitely recommend it. I will. I'm happy to have it in my collection. I will probably. Um, Look to get West Front and uh, and Euro Front at some point, but I think before that I I want to get um, Pacific uh, Victory. Um, am I saying that right? Is it Pacific Victory, Victory in Pacific? Anyways, the one that Columbia does. I think I'd like to try that one out because that looks pretty decent in terms of those sort of grander scale uh, games. Because you know, and this one is that because it's you know a 42 page rule book, right? Granted, the last six pages of scenarios, it's still a you know, typical Columbia games are, are eight pages, and this is this is one of their bigger beasts, which, uh, again, lots of fun. Um, highly recommend it. Um, bigger game. Anyways, I just wanted to make a short video. I didn't want to spend too much time. I'm at 17-minute mark, which isn't too bad. Uh, hope you like it. Uh, leave me some comments or uh, tell me what you think about it. Um, and uh, I'll see you next time. I might go to some Avalon Hills uh, for a little bit anyways before I get back to some Columbias. And I've also got a GMT um, American Revolution uh, game that I got in the summer that I played a bit that I wouldn't mind getting back to too. Anyways, take care. Thanks for watching.